All right, this is it. Your chance to win a $100 Amazon gift card ends this Saturday, August 17th, 2019 at 11.59 p.m. Pacific time. If you're a U.S. resident, just answer 15 questions in my second annual YMYW podcast survey. It'll take you like five minutes. You'll be entered to win the Amazon gift card, and you will help us to make this podcast even better and more useful for you. Find the link to the survey right in the description for today's episode in your podcast app or at the top of the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. Today, Joe and Big Al discuss the big revamp of the tax postcard for 2019 and the tax headaches that the SECURE Act could cause if you have an IRA trust. Plus, they answer your money questions. Is indexed universal life insurance a good investment for education savings? And will Joe need an ambulance when answering this question? Of course, we'll talk about rolling and converting 401k money, and the fellows will let listener Clint know if he's going to jail. I'm producer Andy Last, and here are the hosts of Your Money, Your Wealth, Joe Anderson, CFP, and Big Al Clopine, CPA. Hey, so tell me about the postcard. Well, it's the most exciting thing of the week, tax-wise, right? We have uh, IRS revamps. It's uh, it's new postcard size tax return. Uh, this is a draft return for 2019. So you may recall that in 2018 we had new tax law, and part of the reason for the new tax law was to simplify so that we could do our taxes on a postcard. And so they took the Form 1040, which is was a two-page form, and they turned it into a postcard. So far, so good. Sounds good, right? But then. Every single thing that was on the 1040, they set, they set up support schedules with the same line numbers. So there were six support schedules along with the postcard, which is page one, page two. So essentially, in 2018, they took last year, they took 2017's two-page form and made it uh, eight. eight, eight pages. Yeah. Six support schedules <laughs> and the postcard. <laughs> so anyway, I guess there were some complaints about that. <laughs> And so now they've... Uh, so i got a question for you before you move on. Yeah. So the, the old 1040 before the postcard. Yeah. How, have they ever changed with that in the 30-some-odd years that you've been... Oh, you mean like the like the easy form? No, just the 1040, oh, the, the 1040. standard 1040. No, it's pretty much the same. It's I been mean, the same for... Yeah, they, they, they may have added or deleted a line here and there, but it's basically been the same thing for my entire career. It, it looked the same, same? Yeah. Okay. Now, now in 2018... It's completely uh, different. Yeah, it's, well, it's, it's, what's interesting, it's, it's actually the same exact form. In fact, when you go to Schedule 1 and all the things that are supposed to be added up to put on the postcard... Those are the same line items that were on the original 1040. And when you're looking at your return, it's so much more complicated to try to fit because <laughs> you're looking at it and you go, okay, I got 6,000 income from Schedule 1. Okay, then you go find Schedule <laughs> 1. And then it's capital gains, tax refund, uh, rental property. Right. Okay, then you go back there, back to the first page, and then, oh, pensions. And then you uh, just yep. crazy. Okay. Anyway, so now we're, now we're, uh, the postcard's a little bit bigger, it's an inch and a half. Longer or wider, okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> so they're able to fit a couple more lines, and now they got it down to three support schedules. All right. So now it's five pages. Remember, it used to be two, so now it's the the postcard front and back. Every every little possible inch is taken up. I I will show you, Joe. That's the new that's the new form. Anyway, it's the the page one has eleven lines instead of about six. And page two has a, has a few more, so it eliminated some of the support schedules. Good, and the accounting community is in favor of this. So who creates this stuff? Uh, I don't know, IRS, I guess. <laughs> a couple, <laughs> couple of people so, sitting in the back room. Yeah, graphic artists. Got I don't it. know. Okay. I have no idea. But uh, somebody who was told make this fit on a postcard. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, so it goes back to the original premise of tax simplification and. That idea is good. I, I, I think we all would like simpler taxes, but you can't just say we're going to take this very complicated tax system and so you can put it on a postcard and we'll have 25 support schedules, which is basically what it is. It's the, it's the three or six support schedules that they made plus all the other ones that have always been there, Schedule A, Schedule B, Schedule C, <laughs> Schedule D, right. Schedule E, and so on. They're, they're all still there. Well, they have to be. Yeah, because they have because the tax for different things. because the tax law didn't change. Right, I mean for individuals, it didn't change much at Hard, all. Hardly at all. Oh. 
we got lower we got lower tax brackets and uh, there were a few changes but substantially not much and this is something that I think people don't realize with this new tax law that we got uh, you know in in the end of 2017 what essentially happened was the the new tax act made changes to the existing law it didn't replace it it just changed it and so a few things got tweaked here and there but the things that weren't discussed or talked about are all still there right so it's it's why you can't really do this on a postcard the tax system is very complicated and um the main reason i just read something is that 30 percent of people itemize their deductions right. now with the new law i think last year was 10 yeah a lot less so right. the 20 percent because it's hard because there's only really five or six things that you can write off like medical expenses, if it's over ten percent of AGI, so I mean you got to have a fairly large medical expense. Yeah, and actually last year was seven and a half. Seven and a half of no, AGI, yeah. but it's going to ten. And so what that's left taxes, state taxes, property taxes, but you're limited to ten thousand dollars. You can still deduct your mortgage if it's less than seven hundred fifty thousand or a million if it was before the the enactment date. You can still deduct charity. And that's it. You can't deduct your your unreimbursed employee expenses or your investment well, if you, expenses. I mean, if you are subject to a Ponzi scheme, you can. Well, yeah, you can write those yeah. losses, and you can still take, gambling losses. Still take off your gambling losses. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, that's about it. Um, but so then they increase the overall standard deduction, so more and more people, and only ten percent now. I guess if you have a giant mortgage or give a ton of charity. Yeah, that's, and you have that's a huge right. medical expense, right? You replace right. two knees and two hips and give <laughs> that, a bunch that, of teeth. That could, <laughs> knees and teeth. <laughs> yeah, that would be a really terrible year. It's like you got in a car accident and the knees and the teeth. Hit You're like, wow, what happened? To you? What, that was a t- train accident? <laughs> no, just trying to get a tax deduction. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will tell you, in California and, and other high-tax states where property taxes and state taxes are high, so, and we're in California, so we're limited to $10,000 deduction. And if you paid off your mortgage, then that's your deductions plus your charity. I mean, for the most part. Right. So, so basically, to itemize your deductions, if you are married, you'd have to have about fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 of charity to even claim any, because the standard deduction is that high. Right. Well, it's what, twenty-four? Twenty-four, four, uh, unless you're over 65, then it's a little bit more. So... But I guess that's simpler. But they got rid of exemptions. They not, did, right, you know. So anyway, yeah, uh, we, I, we, I, we, I, we beat this down for yeah, years. Yeah, I know. But I thought you'd be interested in this new tax form. Yeah, and so because I, I still didn't get used to the old one. You're right. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like I'm looking for stuff and I can't find it. It's yeah. It's buried in the schedules. <laughs> it's no. now, and so um, and then of course that brings up another question. Yeah. Would you actually file your taxes on a postcard? Never. I'll put all my stuff on right there. <laughs> yeah. Social Security and Social Security and salary. And right. Here's how much money I made. Just Joe, <laughs> Joe Anderson, fourteen thousand. <laughs> right. That's the stupidest thing. I'm, I, who's going to mail it in on a postcard, Alan? I don't. I can't imagine. I mean, you you, you can't because of the the Social Security number, right? <laughs> I, I, although I have noticed there is no place to put a stamp. <laughs> so it's not really a postcard. It still needs to go in an envelope. But I don't know. Yes. So uh, the Senate and House are still debating on the Secure Act, Alan. They sure are. It's and, and we thought for a while that was going to pass relatively quickly, but that didn't happen. Uh, we still believe that it's going to pass. And one of the biggest things that paid for every small little stupid tweak that they did was get rid of one of the better financial planning tools that the IRS give of, gave us, what, 19 years ago. <laughs> Are you referring to a stretch IRA? I am. Uh, the stretch IRA, which allowed non-spouse beneficiaries to, I guess, stretch out their tax liabilities of the IRA throughout their lifetime. So... With that being said, they're saying, all right, well, you know what? We're not going to let you delay or spread the taxes out over your lifetime. It's going to be over 10 years. And still, that's pretty good. It's, yeah. it's not awful because, to, to be honest with you, I think most people probably blow through that before 10 years anyway. Well, I, I'd say at least 9 out of 10, if not 19 out of 20. That's exactly what they do. But for those of you that are good savers that right. have accumulated a lot of money in retirement accounts, this is where it's really going to have an effect. And the problem is, is that a lot of these individuals that have large retirement accounts, they put in place like an IRA trust to control the money 
from creditors, right, while they're still, well, as their kids are alive, but they're dead, right? So they wanted to have a little bit more control to say, hey, these are a lot of dollars that I saved throughout my life. I'm going to pass it off to the next generation, and I want to secure it so that the kids don't, you know, blow through it. And second, I want to continue to keep it protected from creditors. Right. Right? But there's a big problem now for those of you that have named, like, the trust the beneficiary of your retirement account or that would create an IRA trust at your passing for two main reasons. Because there's two different types of trust. What type of trust do you have in your IRA trust, Alan? Do you uh, know? It's an IRA trust. Yes, but is it a discretionary or is it a conduit? It's uh, discretionary. Okay. So Alan's got a problem, potentially. Alan's trust is still going to be protected from creditors, but now he's got a tax problem. So let me explain the difference between the two. A conduit trust is this, is that, all right, now the IRA is sitting in a trust, okay, and it's going to be Alan Clopine IRA trust beneficiary, blah, 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 right? So you got to have special titling. I'm not going to get through all that BS. <laughs> and, and I need to die. You do need to die, Alan, and I don't this want you to die. This is a sad story already. <laughs> this is. But now the money's in the trust, and then so on a conduit trust, there's a non-spouse beneficiary. So the kids, right? The kids are the beneficiary of the retirement trust. And so they are going to receive a required minimum distribution. Depends on how that trust is set up. Sure. It could be based on the oldest son, or it could be based on, it could split up into several different trusts, and those RMDs would be based on each beneficiary's um, lifespan. Yeah, that's what I have. I, I have subtrust. Subtrust. All right. So super complicated, yeah, right? right? Big Al with a big oh, trust. Look at that. Huh? <laughs> so now he's got subtrust, <laughs> and it's all great, right? And uh, a conduit would just. Pour out the RMD, you know, so if Robbie's got an RMD, it's going to, whatever, here's his RMD, it's going to take it. Or he could take a lot more than that. It, it really depends on, sure. you know, what that beneficiary wants to do. But he has to take at least the required distribution or more. Right. In a discretionary trust, what happens is, is that the RMD stays within the trust. It doesn't go out of the trust to the beneficiary. And then it's by the discretion of the trustee to distribute those dollars to the beneficiaries. Right. But what happens if it's in a discretionary trust, it's now t taxed at trust rates. Yeah, unless it's distributed. If it's distributed, it's going to be the taxed at the individual. individual's Correct. rate. If it stays in trust, it's going to be taxed at trust rates. I agree. If you want to keep it in trust to keep the protection, right, you're going to have a, a terrible tax issue. Yeah, and the reason is because trust taxation, you get to the highest rate, thirty-seven percent at about twelve, thirteen thousand of income. Yeah, thirteen grand of income. That is now now you're in the thirty-seven percent rate. Right, and plus, then plus another plus state. ten ten yeah, percent state for, of California. For us in California, yeah. right. So fifty percent tax rate on anything over twelve thousand dollars of income. Right. So it's like, well, do I want to keep it protected from creditors? You keep it in the discretionary trust, <laughs> right? Or if it's right. a conduit trust, you're like, okay, well, here, I'm going to pass this stuff out, and that RMD would last over their lifetime. Sure. But the RMD is going to, everything is going to be distributed within 10 years. So there's no purpose of really holding the trust because everything is going to be distributed out anyway. So if you want the discretionary trust where you can hold it in trust to protect it, you're going to get screwed there because you're going to yeah. lose half of it to tax. And and that's that's the reason why most people have that is is because it, it allows uh, asset protection and it and it prevents the kids from spending too much. So <clears throat> I guess the point is if you have an IRA that you probably are not going to spend down and you want to pass it to the next generation and you set up a trust to protect that IRA balance to go to your kids or grandkids or something like that, I would highly suggest you sit down with a qualified professional because there's several moves that you could potentially make, but it's not going to be nearly as good as the stretch, right? Now you got to look at Roth conversions. You get that thing into a Roth, right? Because let's say now you have a discretionary trust, you can hold it in trust. Because the distributions are tax free, you're not going to get you know you're not going to get hurt by the the tax uh, the the tax trust rates. Yeah, right. Um, you could set up uh, another type of trust, a charitable remainder trust. We kind of hit on that. I don't know, maybe last year of how that would work. That's complicated as all. It, it is. Too. That's, that's more complicated than I want to get into right now. <laughs> right. So <laughs> there's just there's different things that you could potentially do to to preserve what you have, right? Instead of losing it. 
um, and still accomplish your goals to some degree, right? There's always going to be some give and take here. Transcripts, we've got them. 12 of you have told me in the podcast survey that you didn't know that we have transcriptions. They are available for every single episode of this podcast since February of 2017. Don't let all that typing be in vain. Go to yourmoneyyourwealth.com, pick a podcast episode, scroll down to where it says transcription, and voila, read to your heart's content. Now, for more on how this new retirement legislation could affect your retirement planning, Professor Jamie Hopkins from Carson Wealth and the Hyder School of Business at Crichton University joined us on episode 224 to explain the SECURE Act in detail. If you missed it, just go back to Your Money, Your Wealth podcast episode number 224 in your app or click the link to episode number 224 in today's podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. In the coming weeks, Pure Financial Advisors' own Matt Balderston will talk about Pure's investing philosophy, especially in times of market volatility. And Karsten Yeska from Early Retirement Now will discuss safe withdrawal rates for early retirement. So now would be a great time to subscribe to YMYW and to share this podcast with anyone who will get value from it. Now, if you have money questions, go to yourmoneyyourwealth.com, scroll down and click Ask Joe and Al on air to send in your question as a voicemail or an email. Marcus from Alabama. Yep. Good. AL. AL. Yeah. I was, was going to say Al. <laughs> Marcus and Al. All right. So Marcus writes in uh, from Alabama. Hello, Andy. And she's first, I guess. Joe and Big Al. I'm the one that emails all these people. So. Got it. This is Marcus from Alabama, Tennessee again. All right. Marcus, where the hell are you from? <laughs> are you it's, from Alabama or are you or from Tennessee. Tennessee? It's that slash. Uh, what? Come on. Because... Are you like you giving us, hey, this is Marcus from Alabama, and then you write in again, this is Marcus from Tennessee? I could be from Tennessee. Just if, so you can get if, a couple freebies if it, from if us? If it works out better. And then it's going to be Marcus from, you know, Wisconsin? <laughs> All right. Anyways, I'm enjoying the show in content. Thank you, Marcus from Alabama slash Tennessee. Um, I particularly enjoy, uh, enjoy Joe's response uh, to the fixed index annuity question. Such passion. Thanks, Marcus. Thank you. This was very informative. While you're describing an indexed annuity, I couldn't help but think about how the cons are similar to an index universal life insurance policy. With that said, what are your thoughts around using IULs or any cash value life insurance product as an investment for average family? In particular, uh, an I. UL, Index Universal Life, as a way to invest for child's education instead of the traditional education savings account or the 529 plan. Uh, P.S. No, I'm not in the business, per se. I was, yeah, you, you thought he might be, because yeah. it's such Just, a good question. Yeah, because he's like, hey, you know, he's trying to get information right. from us, to, then he's going to just yeah, th- play it back to his clients. That's what you were thinking. <laughs> yes, right. He still may. <laughs> I know, exactly. Um, I enjoy learning about finances in y- using uh, you to confirm my thoughts and opinions. Uh, with that said, make sure Joe has blood pressure medicine available or paramedics around before he answers this question. <laughs> All Apparently right. you got uh, a little excited with the annuities. I, uh, I will get uh, the ambulance <laughs> on speed dial, yeah. just in case. <laughs> Index universal life insurance policies. Right. So basically, those are insurance policies, permanent policies that have cash surrender value. And he's saying, is this a good alternative for the average family as a way to invest for a child's education instead of traditional ESA or 529 plans? Yeah. So that's the question. <clears throat> All right. So the, the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was easy. Okay, next question. <laughs> yeah. And here's why I say that. Okay. Um, because just say no is just... It's not good it's, enough. It's, it's not good enough. No. And we're, we're, we're really good on this show. And we're transparent, too. Yes. And we may not have the right ideas, <laughs> but right. we have ideas. <laughs> we do. <laughs> and some of you might disagree with me, yeah. but this is where I'm at. Okay. And I know why some people would recommend this, and I understand that, too. So let me just let's just get everything out on the table and then let the people you gotta, decide. You're going to unpack it for I'm us? I'm going to unpack it a little bit. Nice. Okay, I'm, I'm ready for this. Okay, so first of all, what an equity-indexed annuity is, or an equity-linked product, you could have a CD, you could have an annuity, or a, a universal life insurance policy. Is that 
the insurance company is buying a basically a zero coupon bond and putting a call option on it, let's say the S&P 500. And how it's sold is that how would you like stock market like returns with no downside risk? Right. So it's a fixed product, basically. You're not going to lose any money in it. But how it's sold is that you can get higher expected returns than, let's just say, a, a standard CD. And so your your rate of return is 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 kind of based upon the index that you happen to pick. It's linked to it, but it's not, it's not, exact. not going to give you anywhere near what that index does. Right. It's, it's BS. It's when you get into the fine print. Yes, right? Because there's participation rates, there's caps, there's all sorts of stuff. So I was explaining this the other week. And and apparently, you got pretty animated. I, apparently, I did. There's video of that. And then Marcus said, all right, well, here, how about if I put it in an IUL, a cash value life insurance product? So you get the same crappy product, but now it's in a wrapper <laughs> of a, an insurance product, right? Now you can just add more fees. So it's like, all right, well, here, I'm, I'm buying this because I'm thinking I'm getting stock market-like returns with no risk. Well, that that's fantasy land, first of all. So you could get higher, potentially higher returns than a straight fixed annuity or a CD rate with an equity indexed annuity or an equity, geez, equity, <laughs> an index universal life policy. Easy for you to say. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Equity indexed annuity? Is that what you're trying to get or at? A, or equity index indexed life universal in- yeah. life policy. It's the same kind of concept of investing. But now with the IUL, I'm just going to call it that from now on. Yeah, good idea. Is that you have the cost of insurance, right? Okay, so so it's not just the investment. You have to pay for the insurance. So now I'm buying life insurance. But if you die, maybe that's good. Right. So if I need the life insurance, then there's the, here's what the mathematical you know computation needs to look at, is that well if I already paying for life insurance and I also want to save money. Does it make sense because the cost of insurance then is moot because I already have that sunk cost? 99% of the time, it still doesn't add up. I would much rather have this person invest in a 529 plan, ESA, or just a non-qualified brokerage account. Are you fully funding your 401k? Do you have Roth IRAs? Do you have because all of that is fairly cheap? It's inexpensive. Roth IRAs grow 100% tax free. You have FIFO tax treatment. You can pull the money out at any point to pay for college education. 529 plans use that. Here's the naysayers of this. This is why this product gets sold for college education, is that it's a sheltering mechanism for financial aid, right? Or grants or all that other. You know, you're, you're basically frauding the university. I got millions of dollars, but I'm going to shelter it inside a stupid life insurance contract to make the agent rich, and so I don't have so I, I, so I get free th- financial aid. Doesn't look like I have money. It doesn't, look, yeah, because I, I I hit it from whatever. So if you want to play that game, you can do that. So put it into a life insurance contract. The money grows 100% tax deferred. You could pull the money out of a life insurance contract 100% tax free because it has FIFO tax treatment just like a Roth. So you're pulling it out. And then you would have to take loans from the remaining if you want to take the rest of the cash value out. But you have to have a certain level of cash value in the policy for the remainder of the policy or it's going to blow up and then everything is going to be taxable. To you, that were gains. So, so I, I, I suppose another way to say that is, if there's not enough cash in the policy, it could lapse, and that means all the unpaid taxes are due at that time. Right, because everything was tax free to me because I took FIFO out, but then right. the rest, the gains, all I the, took out as loans. All the gains, but right. those loans are now going to be a taxable event. And if the policy goes away, the loans are t- are now taxable. Taxable, yeah, correct. And then it's like, okay, well now I got to keep this thing alive. I got to keep floating it. I got to st- keep putting cash into it. Right. So you got to. Fully fund the thing. You got to max fund this bad boy, right? You got to put a ton of cash inside these policies because there's already a fixed amount of expenses, right? So uh, here's an analogy: is that all right? You're gonna fuel up a, 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 a airplane that fits 400 people, but you're the only guy in it. Makes no sense, right? That airline would go broke. So they got to fill that thing up with 400 people, right, to fly the plane. So that's the same thing with the insurance policy is that if you only got one or two people on the plane, it's not going to work, right? Because you already have these fixed expenses, you got to max fund that thing and throw a ton of cash. So I would say if I'm going to throw a ton of cash at something, it's not going to be inside of a life insurance contract for the average American family or average family. It could be an average Spanish family. 
<laughs> or Portuguese family. Any nationality. Yes. Russian family. Any any family. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that's my explanation there. Okay. That's was that fair? Is that good enough? It's, it was fairly clear. So was, what would you suggest for college saving? 529. Not Roth? You could do Roth, but I'd much rather have the Roth go for retirement. But if, you know, it's sold like this. All right. Well, here. Here's this great product, Alan. Right? But with the Roth IRA, it sucks because you can only put $7,000 into it and you're subject to AGI limitations. Here's this. This is the super Roth. Da, da, da. Right. It's awesome. It's life insurance and every family needs one. Right. You know, when I was a young CPA and I didn't really understand this product very well, uh, what I was told was it's a private pension plan. Oh, yeah. That sounds pretty good. Yeah. It works if, let's say, if I'm fully funding a 401k plan, if my wife is fully funding a 401k plan, and I got Roths and everything else, prior to 2010, though, Roth conversions, you had to have adjusted gross income under $100,000 to do a conversion. Right? That's correct. So prior to 2010, funding a life insurance contract, max funding it, maybe a second to die to keep that insurance really, really low, might make sense, right? But after 2010, it, didn't make it, it doesn't make any sense at all, especially if you don't need the insurance. And the cost of insurance is so cheap today than it was, you know, 10, 20 years ago. Just because of the competition. There's so much more competition with insurance that they're reducing premiums. We're living longer. So the life expectancy and all of that stuff has changed. So, um, no, IUL, I don't know. If you're an insurance agent, you know, God bless you. I understand that there is some absolutely real hardcore benefits in those products. I'm not arguing that. What I'm arguing is that sometimes it's presented in a way to an individual that is not a really good fit where there could be a cheaper, more productive alternative. Is that fair? That's fair. Sure. Not here to rip on anyone or any profession. I'm not a huge fan of some of this stuff as how it's sold, but if, if they understand it clearly, right, that there's a here's their cost of insurance. Here's really the range of return. You're not going to get 8% on this IUL, right? Maybe in a blue moon you could... But I'm not going to run an illustration and saying, let's run this at eight. Right. Net of all fees. Yeah, and this works out pretty good. <laughs> yeah, because look at this. <laughs> you can put in 50 grand and millions come out tax free. Tax free, yeah. Right. This is your private pension, Al. No offense to those good insurance salespeople who are legitimately trying to help people, but before you go buying life insurance from some slick sales guy who's making it sound too good to be true and just trying to get a fat commission, learn about some basic expensive mistakes you'll want to avoid. Download our free white paper, Five Costly Life Insurance Mistakes, from the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. Now, on a completely unrelated note, this week on the Your Money, Your Wealth TV show, Joe and Big Al are getting real about about real estate and retirement, and they want you to watch. You can catch it whenever you want. It's waiting for you at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. Now, let's answer more of your money questions. Scroll down yourmoneyyourwealth.com and click Ask Joe and Al on air to send in your questions, comments, compliments, and complaints. So let's go with um, Connie. Uh, she doesn't give a location. So she goes, hello, I have a question on my 401k. I recently got laid off. I will be getting a severance of one year salary. Uh, do I roll over my 401k to somewhere else? Uh, the plan will be terminated as of December 31st, 2019. Uh, I didn't want to start taking distributions from it until I'm 66, which will be next year, and also take Social Security benefits. Please let me know. Thank you. All right. Um, Connie, so you got a, a lot of different options here. So you got laid off, and she's curious if she should roll over the 401k plan to somewhere else. I'm uh, going to guess that you're going to say you don't have enough information. Well, no, not necessarily with this. Okay. Is, it, it's, there's, there's pros and cons. I can kind of give her the pros and cons here. The only thing I really don't understand is that what she's stating is the plan will be terminated as of December 31st, 2019. I don't know why the plan would be terminated um, because when you retire, you don't have to move the money out of the 401k plan, 
But if the plan is getting terminated, that tells me something else. And maybe she's just saying she's not going to be an active participant in the plan as of December 31st, 2019. Um, if that's the case, he- here's the options. Connie, you can keep the money in the plan. You do not have to roll the money out of the plan um, in most cases, all right? Uh, unless it's under like $5,000. Sometimes they just want to get those small yeah. balances off because they have to you know, do record keeping and send statements and all that. It's just kind of a pain and ex- expensive. Um, but I, I, I'm doubting that that's the case here. So you could keep it in the plan. There's pros to keep money to a 401k plan. One of the pros is if it's a large company, uh, the cost of the investments could be institutional type pricing. Mm-hmm. So it could be cheaper than a, um, you know something that you could get on your own. Um, if you are 55 years of age in separating service at 55, there's no 10% penalty, but I think she is she older than that. She says she's going to be 66 next year, so she's 65. Okay, 65. So um, another reason to keep it in the 401k plan is ERISA protection. Um, so let's say if she gets sued, right, um, files bankruptcy, does whatever. Yep. Uh, she has a little bit better protection in a 401k plan than an IRA. Uh, it really depends on what state she's in. Um, because if you roll over your 401k into an IRA, a lot of that protection carries over up yeah. to a couple million bucks. Um, but it's all based on state by state since she didn't give us where she's, so she needs to do a little bit more research. Um, but if, you know, if, she, if she's a doctor, right, you probably want to keep it in the 401k plan, but if, you know, cause you could get sued or right. you did something like that. Right. Or if you're a self-employed, um, business owner, you probably want to keep it in the 401k plan. If you have a lot of different properties where someone could trip and fall and, you know, break their leg and sue you because you didn't, keep it in the 401k. You know, right. You would keep it in the 401k. Yep. I would say everything else. I, it, I won't worry too much about it. Um, well, but she again, does it's say up she to doesn't want to start taking distributions from it, and so she doesn't need to, right? Well, no. I mean, she can move it into an IRA and still not take any distributions. Yep. The, the pro of an IRA is that you can consolidate. You can kind of keep everything in one place. So if I have a brokerage account, a Roth IRA, an IRA, I have everything then at Charles Schwab, Fidelity, mm-hmm. TD Ameritrade, whatever. Right. Uh, Vanguard. So it's easier to manage. Um, IRAs, you have the full array of investments that you can possibly think of. So you're not tied to whatever the 401k has. Right. It, it really depends on what she wants to do. But she doesn't have to. Um, but should she? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's easy just to, to just to keep it a little bit more organized. Um, and then you can start taking distributions you know, from the IRA or the 401k. But that's what I would do. You know, anytime I left an employer, um, I rolled my 401k into an IRA. Yep. You know, so um, it's just I think it's just easier just to keep things all in one place and simple and uh, easy. Terry from San Diego. Other than the tax impact, impaction, impaction. I think he means the impact that taxes will is have. That Actually, a word? I don't know if Terry is male or female. So is that a word? Impaction to me, it sounds like an impacted tooth or something. Impaction. <laughs> I like to know the tax impaction. Oh, that's that's a cool ass saying. Tax impaction. I don't think that's a word. Oh, it is. The condition of being or a process of becoming impacted. Huh. I like to know the tax impaction. <laughs> is there a maximum that I can convert my four hundred one k to a Roth IRA? I'm seventy three years old. Uh, Terry, the maximum you could con well, you could convert it all outside of your RMD. So, let me explain a few things here. Now, this is four hundred one k two Roth. Okay, well, it, it doesn't matter. Yeah, uh, pension. I think it was a Pension Protection Act of oh six allows four hundred one k's to. Directly go to Roths before you had to go to an IRA to a Roth IRA. Okay. Um, so, what is a conversion? Well, that's taking money from a retirement account that was pre tax that grew tax deferred. And when you take the dollars out, they're taxed at ordinary income rates. A Roth IRA is just the opposite. You don't get a tax deduction going in, grows 100% tax deferred, but when you pull the money out, it's tax free if it's a qualified distribution. So Terry's looking to convert the 401k, pay a little bit of tax, and then put it into a Roth IRA. 
anyone can do this at any time. There is no income limitations. There's nothing, um, no age limitation, nothing. So other than the tax impaction, so what that means is that there's tax on the conversion. The conversion, yeah. Okay. Is there a maximum that I can convert? Uh, and the answer is no. But Terry is over 73. So Terry would have to take his required minimum distribution out of the retirement account first before Terry converts. Mm-hmm. Um Big mistakes happen there where someone's over 70 and a half, where they have a required distribution, they do a Roth conversion. So over 70 and a half is the age that matters. 70 and a half. 73. Yes. 70 and a half or your required beginning date is April 1st, the year after you turn 70 and a half. Mm -hmm. But if you're taking distributions, right? So and that distribution on the RMD is based on December 31st, the prior year. And so if someone does a conversion prior to them taking an RMD, Mm -hmm. it's going to reduce their RMD. Right. Right. So I do a big conversion of $100,000 January 1st, and then December 31st is like, oh, I didn't do my RMD this year. Then I look at the band, right? Yeah, it it potentially could be less. So um, you have to take the required distribution out first, and then you can do the conversion. Mm. So depending on what your tax bracket is, Terry, and how much tax that you want to pay, you absolutely can do whatever you want. But just make sure you take the RMD out first, put that in your brokerage account, checking account, savings account, whatever, and then the remaining could be converted. So if he or she converts, or if Terry converts prior to the RMD, um, then that would be an excess Roth IRA contribution. Ah. And then that would be... So there is a gotcha there. Yeah, there'd be a, a, a penalty um, each year that that excess RMD is actually in the Roth. Okay. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. Okay, we got Clint. He wrote in from Florida. Clint. Um, I have a question about receiving Form 5498 from my Postal MBA union. All right. Uh, the Roth IRA amount of $4,400 was deducted from my pay in 2018. I filed my 2018 return in early April. This is assuming that I received all W-2, 1099, etc. I also received a refund um, of close to $1,400 a few weeks after filing. So early May comes around, and I received this Form 5498 postmarked May 1st, 2019. Should I expect jail time for not adding this line 10 to my 2018 tax return? Wow. Well, Clint, um, for our listeners, a 5498 is it's called the IRA Contribution Form or IRA Contribution Information. These are not due until May. And the reason is because you can do a IRA uh, contribution con- April. till April 15th or a Roth contribution till April 15th. And there's some other stuff on here like uh, like rollover contributions and, and conversions. Uh, conver- right. Yeah, conversions, re-char- nah, recharacterizations, recharacterizations of contributions, also Roth IRA conversion amounts. Anyway, this, this form comes out in May. Now, so if I understand, or I think I understand what you're saying, you had, you had some Roth taken out of your paycheck. Usually, it's a 401k with a Roth option, but uh, there are a few employers that have programs where right out of your paycheck it can go right to a Roth IRA. So I'm going to assume that's true. So $4,400 was was deducted. Now, on line 10, you're referring to on the form 5498, that's the Roth IRA contribution line. Uh, with that Roth contribution, there's nothing you do on your tax return. So no, there's no jail time. <laughs> and and the reason why you got this form after the fact is that's that's as I told you that they don't really know what's going to happen until after tax season comes around. So in I guess in the in certain cases what we find is is people forgot to enter transactions on their return and then they get this form and then you would, would have to go and amend the tax return. But that's that's not your case. In your case you've uh, you did you had Roth IRA, which was apparently deducted from your um, pay, and there's nothing to report. A Roth IRA is non-deductible. Yeah, it's after tax. So don't worry about it. No jail time. Maybe, Clint, 
What else are you doing on your spare time? If you'd like to write in about that, we can see if you can go to jail. <laughs> Maybe that you're implying there's other things. I don't know. I'm getting bored, Al. I want to hear better stories. I want to hear, like, I don't know, something exciting. What do you, I, what do you, I'm just going to shut up. Um, all right. Um, so Ross writes in. Um, you go here, Dear Joseph. He actually wrote Joseph. And Alan. Wow. Uh, I thank you so much for answering my question with clarity and humor. I'm glad my typographical error. All right, I'm I'm with you. On ten thousand dollars damage, when I meant to say ten thousand property tax, was so enjoyable to you both. I am at the age where, when I use my computer, I'm grabbing for one of several different pairs of glasses on my desk, causing my vision not to be so perfect. I appreciate the detail upon which you explained your answers. You characters are still enjoyable, even though I was the butt of your explanation. I don't hit any walls, but I defend all kinds of people who hit one thing or another. Um, Ross got a good sense of humor. I will continue to uh, continue to watch you, as I do learn a great deal from you both. It takes a lot of work to make your future secure to the lifestyle you want. I will continue to watch and learn since my lottery winnings have not yet come in to fruition. Thank you. Take care. Blah, blah, blah. All right. Thanks, Ross. He <laughs> didn't say that. That was me. He didn't really say blah, blah, blah. He said take care. and He loved your show, Joe. Thank you once again. All right. Uh, that's it for us. Andy, great job. Thanks, thanks again Joe. for all your hard work. Uh, Big Al kind of snuck out of here a little bit early. Uh, and I'm Joe Anderson. Thanks a lot for uh, listening once again. Fill out that survey. We're curious on what your thoughts are. We'll see you next week. Yep. You heard the man. Don't forget to fill out my podcast survey in the show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com before August 18th for your chance to win a $100 Amazon gift card. And if you're into the silly stuff, stick around because we've got some derails ahead. And you know, if that's not your thing, just skip out now. But hey, you should know that Your Money, Your Wealth is presented by Pure Financial Advisors. And for your free two-meeting financial assessment with a certified financial planner, you just got to click the free assessment button at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. Pure Financial Advisors is a registered investment advisor. This show does not intend to provide personalized investment advice through this broadcast and does not represent that the securities or services discussed are suitable for any investor. Investors are advised not to rely on any information contained in the broadcast in the process of making a full and informed investment decision. Click on yourmoneyyourwealth.com. Wow, I didn't know what that was. That was a, <laughs> that was a, that was the lion within me, apparently, speaking out to the world. So now I'm I'm doing this live with you with headphones. That was kind of loud. Yeah, I didn't mean that. Was, I, I that hope was, that gets taken out. <laughs> that was something. That was awesome. I hope the That's network that was. producers delete that. And so, what do we got? We got something going on. Um, we got our survey. We're Let's do- talk uh, about yes. that. So, how do you magically just pick a winner? I'm going to put all the names on You're going to write paper. them out by I'm hand and then put them in a hat. put them in a hat oh and my God. choose somebody. Yes. You're going to be like, well, I really like this guy because he gave a five-star <laughs> review. So I'm going to give no, him. No, that's how you would do it, Joe. Oh. <laughs> no funny business here at Your Money or no, Wealth. absolutely not. It will be totally random. As a matter of fact, I think last year it went to somebody who we never heard from again. And I don't know if he even continued listening to the podcast. So. Well, was it the one lady that no, it was, was a guy. like, you know, hey. Can you send me another <laughs> gift card? No, th- no, it was not her. It wasn't her. All right. Um, but we already, already have gotten some some great response. I love the fact that people are, are jumping in, and they've actually given me some suggestions for guests. So I'm I'm working through that list now. So, yeah. So hopefully one of these days we'll be able to get, you know, Elon Musk on the show. <laughs> that would be that, – no, I, I would not listen. You I would wouldn't not listen? Even, no. <laughs> Uh, it's above my pay grade. Okay. I like to keep things simple. Yeah. Right? I'm just getting back from vacation trying to keep up with you. Yes. How was Ireland? It was very nice. Top yeah. of the morning to you. <laughs> Top of the morning to you. You know, we went for a hike in Scotland. Scotland's even harder to understand. Oh, English. yeah. Scottish. I, I learned how to do a good Scottish accent, but I can't do it right now. I need a loaf of bread. You, you step all the bread in your mouth at one time, and then you try to talk. Oh, okay. And it's about the same. It's about the same, huh? But I did, I did go to, uh, on the hike, we had a car. You're driving on the wrong side of the 
road. Well, it's the right side. We drive on the wrong yeah, side. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, right. We, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so did you actually drive? On... Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, probably five, six, seven hundred miles. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so I'm at this gas station, and they have a co- convenience store. So we're buying some stuff for the hike. And the, and the one guy, there's two guys up there, and, and one guy standing next to the cashier goes, I'm, I said, we're going for a hike. He goes, watch out for the midgets. I go, midgets? I, so I, did, I, I didn't know what to make of that. So I said, are they leprechauns? <laughs> he goes, not midgets, midgets. Midgets. Turns out, I didn't know what that was. That's an insect. <laughs> He thought I was a complete idiot. <laughs> oh, um, or racist. Yeah, I suppose. <laughs> well, plus I was in the wrong country. Uh, <laughs> Lep- leprechauns. leprechauns are in Ireland. <laughs> He's thinking, who is this? Oh, this is an American for sure. <laughs> oh, this is Chevy Chase. Valley <laughs> 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 vacation. We got, we got to those roundabouts. Uh, that was something else. <laughs> plus you're on the wrong side uh, of the road. Look, kids. Big Ben. Parliament. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. oh, that was pretty good. <laughs> I didn't think that we would get as many questions as We've we get tons. each week. We've tons, yes. And, and the podcast is becoming more and more popular. So It is, thanks to you, Andy. I work for that. Yeah. But, you know. <laughs> I work for that. <laughs> I was going to say just, something oh my that God, I realized like just, I better know. Yeah, we I, just trap her in this little <laughs> box. Hey, and, you're in this box with me, pal. <laughs> and, you know, we put a cage and then we just throw bread underneath the door and say, <laughs> eat when, <laughs> when you're finished.